Horror games suck. Quite a bold statement to make right at the onset of the video, but hey, I gotta get that audience attention up somehow. But seriously, as a lover of all things horror, you would expect me to be at the exact level of mental instability that's required to enjoy horror video games. Despite my love for horror books and movies though, I found it impossible to derive any sort of joy from most horror games, and I think I finally placed my finger on exactly why that is. In my head for the longest time, I made a distinction between good horror and bad horror. Good horror, for me, leaned more into that sense of dread. It built on our most primal fears to elicit an impactful emotional reaction. A reaction that would stay with us and have us looking over our shoulder when we walked home alone at night. That's why movies like Hush and Get Out are among some of my favorites. They nail that impending feeling of doom, that unease that we all experience but find hard to articulate at times. Even films like Insidious, which rely heavily on jump scares to get that exact reaction, still manage to build that anxiety effectively. The difference here is that this anxiety finds a release, and those familiar with horror movies can anticipate exactly when that release will come. The problem with horror games, then, is that they aren't able to capitalize on that dread, aren't able to effectively evoke that adrenaline rush that I crave when I watch horror movies. Now a lot of people might disagree. I mean, Alien Isolation was lauded for doing an effective job of making the player fear their every move, lest it trigger a death state. But the way I look at it, that death state is simply a minor annoyance and nothing more. Isolation is at its best when you're playing a deadly game of cat and mouse with the xenomorph. As soon as you're caught, though, you're reminded of all the progress you just lost and have to redo. Survival horror games like Outlast 2 are scary when you're going through them for the first time. As soon as you get stuck on a section and have to chase the same few enemies over and over again to hopefully make it across the cornfield this time, they just become annoying. More than that, survival horror games oscillate between showing you too much and showing you too little. I don't know about you, but stopping my toe at night makes me feel angry not scared. And that's exactly how I feel when I'm forced to wade through the darkness, walking headfirst into invisible walls or fences that should clearly be scalable. When these games aren't shouting you in the dark, a lot of them tend to show you what you're up against. This is almost invariably the moment where I drop off from a horror game. I don't care how much blood you have on your character model, and I don't care how many vertices your head has. Showing me what I'm supposed to be dreading and asking me to beat it head first completely overrides any feeling of anticipation I've had up till this point. The reason why movies like Get Out fare well is because the underlying evil in them is abstract. It's indescribable. The main villains may be the host family, but the problem runs much deeper, and it's inescapable. Cosmic horror also utilizes the fear of the unknown to great effect, and a lot of horror books manage to use your own imagination against you. You fill in the blanks in the worst way possible because that's what you're trained to do, and no set of polygons will ever come close to what your mind can conjure up. Although PS1 Hagrid does come close. Another rule that horror games have to follow due to gaming convention, and just common sense honestly, is that the player needs to have a chance to defend themselves or run away in some manner. The game needs to be fair. But the thing about horror is that it's really fair. If the world worked exactly how we think it worked, if horror didn't make us question our expectations of the world and of normalcy, it would be stale. If that one blonde girl that Jason's after used her wits, or if indeed Jason didn't have the superhuman abilities that he does, Jason would stop being quiet as threatening. The horror of horror movies and books comes from being a passive observer, seeing a scenario play out after the fact, forced to think about its ramifications. Very often, we think we fare better in these scenarios than the protagonists. Horror games allow us to see just how well we do, but this is within the boundaries of the game's gameplay systems, which prevent you from saying adios to your wife and taking the next flight home from whatever hellish house she's gotten herself stuck in this time. But that's not the only way in which fairness comes in the way of an authentic horror experience. No. The true culprit here is the lack of unpredictability. The game gives you control. 
you do what it says and as soon as something mildly interesting is about to happen, control is wrestled away from you and oh look, now you're down a few fingers. Because the game is giving you so much control, it needs to take that control away to provide some genuinely surprising moment. The true horror is restricted to cutscenes and at this point, I'd rather just watch a competent horror movie than waste my time trying to figure out the best route past the lunch lady. This lack of unpredictability also comes from a lot of games like Outlast giving what is essentially a jump scare before a jump scare. Since there needs to be a way for the player to recognize that they're being chased by an entity and that it's probably time to run, there's usually some dialogue or music stinger following player detection by the AI but preceding the AI actually catching the player. Again, that pathway of anticipation and release is disrupted. One game that subverts this well is Alien Isolation since there are moments when the xenomorph feigns walking away only to return for a little snack. So now that we have an understanding of why horror games are bad, let's try and build a better one. If I were to lay the foundations for the perfect horror video game, two features that would be essential would be permadeath and unpredictability. The issue with permadeath is that it simply adds even more annoyance if a player were to die, since instead of restarting the last checkpoint, they would have to restart the entire game. It would make the game scarier to play, for sure, but when placed alongside the unpredictability that's by its very nature meant to make the game unfair, my ideal horror game would play more like one of those unfair Mario games than scream in video game form. And this is where I flip the script and tell you that I do not, in fact, hate all horror games. Because like horror villains, not all horror games are made equal. Seriously, try harder, Annabelle. No, I'm a die-hard fan of the Dark Pictures Anthology or pretty much any other game released by Supermassive. These games are narrative-driven horror games and they're a blast to play through. The gameplay is limited to you making decisions and maybe exploring a little sometimes, but there is a very real risk of your characters dying if you make a misstep. One of my favorite moments in Until Dawn comes towards the end of the game and it nails the feeling of surprise that I want these games to have. While playing as Ashley, one of the main leads, you can choose to walk away from the group to check out a screen. What's brilliant about this moment is that it comes in the middle of a walking section. Going by the logic of the game, you should be more or less immune in these sections, so what's the harm in checking out that screen? But unless you stick to the age-old rule of never isolating yourself in a horror movie, you'll meet a grisly end. The game isn't being unfair here. It's more or less told you that you shouldn't follow unknown sounds and logic also dictates that. But on a more meta level, it plays with your expectations of what should or should not be possible in this game. And that's what makes this moment stand out to me. That's also why I absolutely adore horror sections in non-horror video games. I remember playing a WWE game for the PSP once and a friend of mine got so creeped out by a nightmare section that he refused to go on with the career mode. Segments like that fake out glitch from Arkham Asylum or that man bad jump scare from Arkham Knight or that one beeping angel sections from The Witcher 3 all stand out because they're one-offs. These are completely unexpected bits that are out of place in the games they're found in and that's what makes them all the more scarier. With that, it's time to turn our attention away from good horror and back towards bad horror because bad horror isn't all that bad actually. When I was younger, I was weirdly stingy about watching horror movies that conform totally to the conventions of psychological thrillers. As I've grown older, I've gained a newfound appreciation for what I earlier deemed bad horror, the more campy, gory, and fun brand of horror that's readily apparent in something like Malignant or the original Nightmare films. In my opinion, action horror games are some of the best horror games because they tend to lean into this exact brand of horror. They embrace the macabre, but do so in an absurd and frequently humorous way. That's the making of a good action horror game for me. An awareness that the content matter is ludicrous and a willingness to explore that very strangeness. Something like Resident Evil Village interests me because it isn't afraid to show, for example, a tall vampire lady and then immediately transform her into a dragon that you now have to fight. If the anticipation release pathway is hard to achieve in a game, it only makes sense to focus on the release part entirely by giving the main character a bazooka and telling them to shoot the glowing spot on the creature's back. Any discussion of horror games would be remiss if it didn't talk about the indie horror scene. 
So many of the most influential horror games have come from the innovation of independent developers, ones who don't need to worry as much about audience reception, not in the same way that AAA releases do at least. It's been stated and restated that Amnesia did more for gaming YouTubers than any other game ever, and it's this communal aspect of indie horror that I want to talk about. Games like Five Nights at Freddy's, while having fairly engaging gameplay, don't succeed solely on the basis of their mechanics. The online communities surrounding these games grow to have a life of their own. The purposely incomprehensible story of FNAF has spouted many an online forum dedicated solely to its discussion. The level of notoriety achieved by Five Nights at Freddy's left a blueprint that many indie devs still follow. Most recently, Poppy Playtime became at first popular for its opaque episodic storyline and later infamous for using NFTs to put that storyline behind a paywall. I think that there's still a lot of potential for games like this though, and the level of involvement that you can reach by trying to solve the enigmas that are the stories of these games give rise to an all new type of horror. One that stems from these obscure stories, from the feeling you get as you try to put it all together, a hunt for an answer which may or may not exist, a hunt that can drive you to madness if you're not careful. Oh wait, sorry, really got into that whole horror storyteller vibe there. No, your FNAF fans are losers. But you can save yourselves if you just like and subscribe.